Okay, everybody, welcome back to lab for lab number seven. This is actually our last lab that has any physiology in it. Lab number eight does not. It's purely anatomy and histology. And the physiology in this lab, what has come to affectionately be known as the P lab, and yes, that's what actually people say, and when they see my students marching up and down the halls with their styrofoam cups and the lids on, everybody knows exactly what they're doing. They're collecting urine samples. Urine samples are great things to test. The kidneys are great things to examine because of their massive efficiency. Hopefully you've picked up on some of that in your lectures, and if you haven't covered the urinary system yet, I'm quite certain that you soon will. Nobody beats the kidneys for efficiency. But in today's lab, what we have is the human kidney study, which is models, the anatomy of our models. We also have sheep kidneys to look at, but only six things to notice on those. Histology, which is much better, in my opinion, than the histology of the digestive or endocrine systems because it's pretty straightforward. And if it happens to be around lunchtime for you, like it is for me, maybe so much the better for understanding the histology. You'll see what I mean then. And then we have the physiology experiment, which of course, those of you watching this can't be here to perform, but you will see it done by a few student volunteers that I brought into lab, of course, maintaining our safety protocols with masks and gloves and so on. So four things in today's lab, anatomy, anatomy, histology, and physiology. Each individual thing is not really that bad, but when you lump them all together, it's a good bit of information for lab quiz number seven. So let's get started with human kidney anatomy on our models. Okay, so I've repositioned my camera. I will attempt to give you the best video image I can create for these various models. And I don't know if you can tell, what I've done here is brought over some of the good old torsos, head and shoulders model, and so on, to serve as backstops for these plaque models, which most urinary models are. That way we can get a nice straight on look at these things. So follow along with me in your lab manual. Let's talk about the first section, the kidney the organ itself. So here we're looking at a relatively old model of a kidney, but it's pretty good. It shows me some things that I can't see as well on some of the other models. So let's go through some of these structures on this one first. The very first anatomical structure we see is the renal capsule. That is simply the outside portion of the kidney, the renal capsule, the outside part of the kidney. So right out here is the renal capsule. Right here is the renal capsule. We can even see it shaded differently on a few of the other models we'll be looking at. The kidney is divided into two regions because it's essentially a solid organ. I don't know if you are aware of that, it's essentially a solid organ, so it has a cortex right here and a medulla or middle portion right there. In fact, you can tell the medulla by these pyramid-shaped structures that I see here in this pinkish color on this model. Those are called renal pyramids. You'll hear about those in your lecture. So the medulla is made up of these pyramids and these areas in dark brown on this model called renal columns. So notice that the medulla is made up of pyramids and columns and I'm going to have you make a change in your lab manual right here where it says renal medulla. Make sure that you change that to renal pyramids. So these triangular shaped structures here, 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 here. These are renal pyramids. 
the dark areas between them that actually look like inward projections of the cortex, these are what are called renal columns. The whole region that they're both in is the medulla. Cortex, medulla, pyramids, and columns. We also have the tips of the pyramids. Not too great on this model, better on some of the others. The tip of the pyramid right here is called a renal papilla. Papilla, little bump-like structure. So this is a renal papilla, that's a renal papilla, that's a renal papilla. The points of the pyramid. The other structures that we have, I can see right here on this model, I will show you, are these little tubes that I see right here. Now you'll learn about this in your lecture, but as we form urine, it drips out of these papillae into these channels, these tunnels, called calyces or singular a calyx. So if I just have a calyx associated with one pyramid, this is called a minor calyx. If I have a calyx where two or more minors come together, that's a major calyx. Again, I have other models that'll show this a little bit better. And then where all the calyces come together, right here where my finger is, is called the renal pelvis. This is the pelvis, where all these tubes come together. The only other structure that I have listed here with the kidney itself as the organ is a renal sinus. See where this adipose is located here and here, these little gaps in the tissue, these are renal sinuses. Now again, remember, no model is perfect. Some show some things better than others. This model, great for the capsule, the columns, the pyramids, the medulla. Beautiful for that. Not bad sinuses. Some of the other structures, maybe not quite so hot on here, like the major and minor calyces. So let's move next door to this model, focusing your attention only on the actual organ, the kidney, on the left here. Let's zoom in a little bit on the actual organ. So here we are looking at this kidney in a little closer detail. So right here where my pointer is, this is the renal capsule. This area that my finger is moving in, this is the cortex of the kidney. This area where I can see the pyramids, that's the medulla right here. Now you'll notice I don't have nice beautiful columns here. Here's one I can see, a pretty obvious renal column, but I don't have beautiful columns on this one like I did on the first one. So we have to Pause me, rewind, look at various models to see all these structures well. But notice here, right here, a beautiful renal papilla, the tip of a pyramid. Papilla, 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 like that. And I can see the plumbing network very nicely here. See where my probe is? A channel coming off one pyramid, this is a minor calyx. Here is another minor calyx, right there. And do you see where these two come together? Right here, from here to there. Let me use my fingers. Right there, that's a major calyx because two have merged into one. This area right here, the whitest whitish structure you see right here, renal pelvis. Notice these gaps between the calyces right here. 
right here. These are sinuses of the kidney. These are renal sinuses. Let's look at still another one. So I'm just sliding my way here to this very nice kidney model that I can see. Notice right here where my pointer is, what's that? The renal capsule. The renal capsule. What's this area right here where my finger is? The cortex of the organ, certainly. See my pyramids? Renal pyramids, sometimes called medullary pyramids, might help you with the naming. For us, of course, we'll stick with what it says in the lab. And remember, we've changed it. Renal pyramids here. I can see a renal column right there. Not bad, but not as nice as the first one. Here's another renal column right there. I can see beautiful papillae. And then again, the same thing with the plumbing network. Let me zoom in a little bit right here for us. So I can see my papilla, my papilla. This is a minor calyx. This is a minor calyx. And where the two come together, right here, major calyx. If I zoom out a little bit and look up, I can see it maybe even a little more plainly here. Minor calyx, minor calyx, and see where they merge? Major calyx, right there, where all the calyces come together right here, renal pelvis. And I can see very nicely here, look at this, Renal sinus, renal sinus, these little gaps between the calyxes are renal sinuses. Capsule, cortex, medulla, made up of the renal pyramid and the renal columns. Papilla, minor calyx, major calyx, pelvis. Very, very nice kidney model right there. Next up in our list of structures, we have what's given under the heading nephron. A whole bunch of structures here that I can see quite nicely in this model, and I have one other that is very similar that can show us nephron. The nephron, as you may have already heard in lecture, or you soon will, exists partly in the cortex and partly in the medulla. In fact, if I just slide over here, these two models side by side on this plaque, the one on your right is just a very blown up version of what you see over here. So see these little structures round, they're actually three-dimensional like spheres here in this cortex. That's what these are over here. So this one is just greatly magnified for us to show us nephrons. Now the primary part of a nephron that everyone thinks about is what's called the nephron or renal tubule. That's this whole thing, start right here with me and follow along this sort of yellowish structure that coils around, dips all the way down here like this, and back up. This is the nephron tubule in yellow. And it has several parts that we have to know the name of, that you have to be able to recognize in this model or its neighbor that we're going to look at in a few minutes. So let me take you through the parts of the tubule first. Then we'll start talking about some of the other things. So first off, I want you to notice I can see right here and right here. Now this is the yellow portion that we're looking at. This is what's called Bowman's capsule or the glomerular capsule right here. Sort of a C-shaped structure when we look at it 
cut in a section like this one that we see. So Bowman's or the glomerular capsule. I'll zoom in a little bit. To me, these structures always resemble sort of a Pac-Man for the video game fans, maybe a catcher's mitt. So this is the glomerular or Bowman's capsule right there. And you can see shooting off of it this coily snake-like portion of the tubule right here that's close to the capsule that's called the proximal convoluted tubule proximal because it's close to the capsule convoluted because it has a bunch of twists and turns in it so the proximal convoluted tubule then I have this straight shot going down from the proximal convoluted tubule that eventually makes a U-turn right here. This is called the nephron or the renal loop. This is called the loop. It still tick technically has a person's name attached to it even though we're trying to get rid of that in a and P, it's often referred to as the loop of Henley, very commonly. Nephron loop, we'll go with that one for the lab. That is the more accepted 21st century name. Now, the loop has a section that runs down, makes a U-turn, and then comes back up. This whole downward running section is called the descending limb of the nephron loop. So in order, look at the glomerular capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, descending limb, and then after the U-turn, guess what it's called? Ascending limb of the loop of Henle, the entire U-turn. Notice the nephron right next to that one has a much deeper loop of Henle almost off the bottom of the screen to see the whole thing. That's the difference you'll see in your lecture between a cortical and a juxtamedullary nephron. But let's look at this one. Right here I can see the glomerular capsule the proximal convoluted tubule coming out of it, the descending limb of the loop of Henle, the U-turn and the ascending limb coming back up. How do I know descending versus ascending limb? Well, watch as I try to do the camera work to show you. I'll do my best here, everyone. So hopefully you can see this in enough detail. This is the glomerular capsule right here. This is the proximal convoluted tubule. It's the one coming straight off of it. And that leads into the descending limb. So find the glomerular capsule find the proximal convoluted tubule, and that goes directly into the descending limb of the loop of Henle, or the nephron loop. The other side is the ascending limb. So let me back out a little bit. Glomerular capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, descending limb, ascending limb, and the entire U-turn is the loop of Henle. Look at it on this one. Glomerular capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, descending limb, ascending limb of the loop, the nephron loop, and then I get to the other convoluted 
tubule, this one, which is not coming off of the glomerular capsule, this one is called the distal convoluted tubule. This is the distal convoluted tubule. So once again, I don't mind repeating, glomerular capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, descending loop, or sometimes called the descending limb, descending nephron loop is what your manual says, so we'll stick with that, glomerular capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, descending nephron loop, ascending nephron loop, the whole U-turn is the nephron loop, and then over here, I have what's called the distal convoluted tubule. Let's do it on the other side. You won't be able to see the entire tubule here, but enough of it, I think. Glomerular capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, descending nephron loop, ascending nephron loop, and distal convoluted tubule here. And then what I can see are these tubules leading into this big vertical yellow tube right here, which is called the collecting duct. You can see what the model builder did was they tried to show you various distal convoluted tubules coming into this collecting duct. This is the collecting duct serving numerous tubules. Collecting duct right there. Now again, this structure I just took you through is the nephron tubule. I can see it also right here on this model. So again, looking at this tubule, I have the glomerular capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, descending nephron loop, ascending nephron loop, distal convoluted tubule, and this one going all the way down, collecting duct. The collecting duct. The nice thing I would say about this particular model is the coloring because I can see quite easily here the proximal convoluted tubule is in this light or pale green, distal convoluted tubule in this tan color right there. And if you follow the proximal convoluted tubule down, okay, here we go, two-handed, trying to do camera work for you here. This is the descending nephron loop and then it changes color to tan, ascending nephron loop, distal convoluted tubule, and collecting duct going all the way down. It's actually these collecting ducts that tend to make kidneys look rather stripy in their pyramids. Notice how this looks very striped here. This is fairly typical for a kidney pyramid. It would be seeing a real one. I, I mean that. So these stripes that you see here, these are actually collecting duct after collecting duct after collecting duct. So what we just went through is what's called the nephron tubule or the parts of the tubule. If we look at this thing right here, which is just blown up again. So, so you understand the model. The whole kidney, we saw right there, a blown up section, and then an even larger blown up glomerular capsule right here, or Bowman's capsule. Both names are acceptable these days. Why is this thing called the glomerular capsule? Because it in circles, it covers, it surrounds this capillary bed called the glomerulus. 
So all of this, this is a capillary network, a capillary bed that you see here. This is called the glomerulus. It's part of the nephron. And Bowman's capsule surrounds it like a catcher's mitt around a softball. So glomerular capsule, glomerulus. That's the blood vessel. Now this capillary bed is a little different than most capillary beds, and you'll learn all about it in a lecture. It has an arteriole coming in and an arteriole going out. The one coming in right here where my finger is is called the afferent arteriole going into the glomerular capillary bed. The one going out is called the efferent arteriole going out. How can I tell them apart? Well, look for the afferent to be larger in diameter most of the time. And it's got these highly specialized smooth muscle cells that surround it. And it sits right next to this thing, which is a little section of that distal convoluted tubule. And these cells right here, I'm waving my finger over them right now, together are called the juxtaglomerular apparatus. You'll learn the jobs of the different cell groupings here in your lectures. But this combination of smooth muscle cells right here surrounding the afferent arteriole and tubular cells right here of the distal convoluted tubule. So imagine a little rectangle right here where I'm drawing with my probe. This is called the juxtaglomerular apparatus. So again, just learning some of the names. Afferent arteriole, glomerulus, efferent arteriole, and juxtaglomerular apparatus. Now, there are a couple other structures to know here before we leave. The most notable of them are these cells that you see right here. These are called podocytes or foot cells. That's where they get their name. Somebody thought they looked like they had a bunch of feet on them. If you imagine my hand here is the glomerular capsule and my fist is the glomerulus, if I remove the glomerulus, the inside surface of this glomerular capsule, that's where these podocytes are. So these are the cells of the glomerular capsule that are covering the capillary bed, the glomerulus. Hopefully that makes a lot of sense when you hear about it in your lectures. For lab, for the online lab, Make sure you know the name of these cells. You see them sort of light pink here, podocytes. Let's move over to my other very nice renal corpuscle. If I didn't mention it, that's what we call this whole thing. The combination of the glomerulus, the capillary bed, as you can see, this one's removable. It falls out sometimes. The glomerular capsule, the two of them together, that's called the renal corpuscle. So this whole thing that's covered by my hand is the renal corpuscle. Notice the larger afferent arteriole with its cells exposed. Notice the, what color would you call this? sort of dull yellow podocytes, the little blue things are the nuclei of those podocytes. Very nice glomerulus right here. And let me zoom in. So looking quite a bit closer in at this glomerulus, the capillary bed, just to help you out in lecture a little bit, I don't know if you can see, 
but there are all sorts of little bitty holes here in the glomerulus. This is a heavily fenestrated, we say in a &P, capillary bed. It has lots of holes in it. And these yellow podocytes that you see here, again, this dark spot is the nucleus of the podocyte. These podocytes have little slits between them, little gaps between the feet of the cells. And this is where filtration happens right here. You might remember in lab, I told you that your liver doesn't really filter anything, but the kidneys do right here. So remember this for your lecture, not to get too lectury here, but that is where filtration happens. So again, the glomerular or Bowman's capsule, the afferent arteriole, wider, notice the smooth muscle cells surrounding, the efferent arteriole going out, the cutaway cells here, and the combination of cells here where my finger is and here, this is the juxtaglomerular apparatus. The yellow cells here are podocytes. This entire structure here is called, whoops, is called the renal corpuscle. And you can see coming right off this glomerular or Bowman's capsule, the proximal convoluted tubule. I will never ask you proximal convoluted tubule here. I would ask you that from one of these big tubules over here where you can see everything. Now, before I leave this idea of the nephron tubule, the nephron is the tubule and the blood vessels associated with it, meaning the afferent and efferent arteriole, the glomerulus, and what you see here right here in this model. I'm going to show it to you in both of my models. Notice these blood vessels going down here, actually parts of what's called the paratubular capillary. This is for lecture. These blood vessels right here that run down and back very straight Vesa recta, straight vessels. Vesa recta, right here. This is actually a group of capillaries that cover these nephron loops that you see. If I slide over here to this model, I can see Vesa recta right here. Long, straight blood vessels, the Vesa recta the straight vessels. Hopefully you can see those. Next up we're going to discuss some of the blood vessels that can be seen going in, through, and out of the kidneys. Now I've come over here to the other side of the table where my torsos are because you thought we were done with blood vessels. Au contraire, I say to you, we are not. So notice the kidney here and here. The red artery going in to the kidney, renal artery. The blue vein coming out, renal vein. And then notice this thing right here. Sitting just above each kidney, we have an adrenal gland. So what do you suppose we call the blood vessels that go in and out of that gland? The renal or adrenal artery and vein. So the red one going up into the adrenal gland, adrenal artery, the blue one coming out, adrenal vein. I can see exactly the same thing on the next model over. So notice red going in, coming right off this abdominal aorta here, see how smart you are, be proud, the renal artery. Blue coming out, renal vein. Adrenal gland right here, 
red going up and in, adrenal artery, blue coming out, adrenal vein. I think those are pretty straightforward. Everybody will get those, hopefully, knock on lab table. The trick or harder thing is all these blood vessels we have going through our kidneys. So here's a nice shot of an isolated kidney. And I can see very nicely here a renal artery, renal vein, I think pretty easy. No adrenal gland here, so no adrenal blood vessels. But then I can start following the arteries in and the veins out of my kidney. So follow along with me here in this model. This is the renal artery. It branches into what are called segmental arteries. Right here is one and there's another one that's been cut. These are segmental arteries. See another one over here. So the renal artery goes in and then it branches into segmental arteries. And now we have to go in the Wayback Machine. This is as old as I am, maybe even a little older. Way back in the day, these renal pyramids, they used to be called lobes, way back when. So notice as the artery continues to move toward the cortex of the kidney, the segmental artery branches into this one that goes between two pyramids. That's called an interlobar artery. This used to be a lobe, that used to be a lobe, an artery that goes between two lobes, interlobar artery. Now, why do I say that name so careful with my articulation? Because we also have interlobular arteries and veins. Very similar name, so be careful. So again, follow me on the arterial side. Renal artery, segmental artery, interlobar artery. And then notice what these interlobar arteries do. They hit the back of the pyramid and then they make an arch or an arc, if you will. That makes this an arcuate artery. Here's another one right here in red, the arcuate artery. Here's a great big one right here, arcuate artery. So notice these interlobars go between the pyramids, and then the arcuate arteries arc over the back of the pyramid. So arcuate artery, arcuate artery. The arcuate arteries then branch into even smaller blood vessels, which are called interlobular. Again, going into the Wayback Machine, these little structures here in the cortex, once upon a time, were called lobules, little tiny lobes. So a blood vessel that goes between them is interlobular. In your lecture, if you're getting a little more 21st century, you might have heard these referred to as the cortical radiate arteries and veins. Notice how they radiate out like spokes on a wheel. It's these blood vessels that will then branch into the afferent arterial. So, one more time, just the arteries now. Stick with me. Renal artery, segmental artery, interlobar artery, arcuate artery, interlobular artery. I know those names are a little tough, so be careful and say them several times. Now, coming back the other way with the veins, interlobular vein in blue, arcuate vein in blue, 
interlobar vein in blue. You will notice in your list, they do not list segmental veins. Tiny little pet peeve of mine, because what do you suppose these things would be? Yes, but this is not on the list, so I can't ask you that. So as an anatomist, it uh, grates me a little bit. But on the veins again, starting from the back in the cortex, interlobular vein, arcuate vein, interlobar vein, renal vein. Let's see it on my other nice model showing the same. I will zoom in just a touch for us here. So in red, the arterial flow, renal artery, segmental artery, interlobar artery, arcuate artery, interlobular Arteries. Remember, these might, in your textbook and your lecture, also be called cortical radiate arteries. On the venous side, this model only has one right here. Look at this. Interlobular vein. In blue, arcuate vein. Interlobar vein. Yeah, yes, one's going to say renal vein. So veins, once again, interlobular vein, arcuate vein, interlobar vein, <laughs> renal vein. In fact, you can see right next door here, see the arcuate vein and artery here? This would be interlobular artery and vein coming back, they just made it a little bigger there. So those are the blood vessels we have. Last little view right here on this older model. Remember, any model I use here or in the practice video is fair game. I think quite nicely done renal artery, renal vein. Segmental artery, what do we call that? And then we sort of peter out at the interlobars. And they have arcuates here, but they look like sort of dashed lines. I don't like that. So renal vein, renal artery, very nice. Segmental artery, very nice. And can't ask it. The arteries and veins of the kidney. Now we're almost to the end. Let's look at another urinary model, shall we? So the nice thing about this model is that it shows us the entire urinary system, which is pretty nice. So I can see my kidneys here. I don't know if these pyramids are that great. I do have, however, a nice renal vein and artery here, adrenal arteries, see them going into the adrenal gland, but that's not what we look at this model for. What we look at this model for are these two things right here, which are the ureters. These are the ureters, which lead to the urinary bladder. So one ureter from each kidney and it ends in this structure down here called the urinary bladder, which I will zoom in on like so. So I hope my camera is showing you this okay. <clears throat> here we have the wall of the urinary bladder very thick with smooth muscle, it has a fundus, it has rugae, transitional epithelium, all sorts of nifty stuff, but I can't ask you all of that. What is it I get to ask you 
about the urinary bladder. I get to ask you, these two holes, these are the openings of these two ureters. They dump into the bottom of this urinary bladder. I also have singular one opening to the urethra, which is right here. So two openings of the ureters, one opening of the urethra. And this, of course, would be the urethra going down. Before I leave this view, however, I want you to notice this triangular shaped structure we see right here. Each corner is one of the openings. Ureter, ureter, urethra. This triangular shaped structure, which is the floor essentially of the urinary bladder, is called the trigon. That's the way we say it in the United States. If we want to get a little more European, we would elongate the O and say trigon, but Trigon is what we say mostly here in the United States. That's this triangular shaped structure right here. I also have next door in this model both a female urethra coming out of the urinary bladder right here and a male urethra coming out of the urinary bladder right here. So we can see the urethras, the tubes that carry the urine from the bladder out of the body in these two models. But let's look at another one while we're looking at the bladder. So here we have this urinary model, which again shows me a nice renal vein, renal artery, ureter, ureter, and this is the urinary bladder down here, which if I was to remove it, I can see the same sort of idea as the other urinary bladder I just saw. So notice opening of the ureter, opening of the ureter, opening of the urethra, and this triangular shaped trigon right here in that urinary bladder. If I reposition it in here, you can see the same. Opening of a ureter, opening of a ureter, opening of the urethra, and trigon right there. One more thing that can only, only be seen on this old model, one of the reasons we keep it around amongst my models here, is this that you see this hint of yellow. Let me rotate it so you can see it a little more. Right here, this is the all-important perirenal fat. That's what this is called perirenal fat or perirenal adipose. The position of your kidneys, posterior, retroperitoneal, these are terms you probably heard in lecture, the kidney is typically anchored against the dorsal body wall by a whole bunch of adipose. So in a good model, we often see a depiction of what's called perirenal fat right there. But of my models in this lab, this is the only one that has perirenal fat. I can see more of it right down here, the yellow. Okay, what we're looking at right now is a couple of very fresh sheep kidneys. Fresh out of one of my buckets, not fresh out of the sheep. They've been in formalin for a long time. And in a more natural orientation, we would probably have something about like this. Only six structures 
that I'm allowed to ask you from the sheep kidney dissection, which is too bad, because you people probably know I love cutting up some dead stuff. I can ask you the outside of the organ, which is the capsule, renal capsule, and I can ask you these two tubes, which are the ureters. Be careful, don't say urethra. The other four structures that I could ask you would be seen on the inside of one of these kidneys. So let's go ahead and dissect one, shall we? So I simply make an incision, like I mean it, down the length of this kidney, working my way through the entire organ with my scalpel. And there we have a kidney opened up for us. If we zoom in a little bit, Trey, I can see a few things now. If we look closely, see the color difference here. This is the cortex. Capsule outside, cortex right here. So see the darker area right here. This is the medulla. So cortex right here, medulla on the inside is darker. The only two remaining structures are pyramids and columns. Now, if I tilt this up a little bit, I think you can see a pyramid right here, a medullary pyramid. There's another one right here. So this area of tissue between them is a renal column. Let's dissect this other kidney and see if it shows up a little better in that one. So here's the other kidney dissected. Notice the cortex, lighter shading, medulla, darker. On the other side, cortex, the outer portion, medulla, the middle. I can even see this is the renal pelvis right there, which is not fair game on a sheep kidney. If I move some of this tissue around a little bit, I think you can see this darker pyramid right here. At least I hope you can. And then this area between two pyramids is a renal column. This is probably a nicer view right here. I'll even see if I can zoom in a little better for you. So this is a renal pyramid right here. This is a renal column right there. Not bad in this particular kidney. Sometimes they're hard to see. I'll grant you that. I'll see if I can find one that shows up even better than this one. So here's another one I found and cleaned up a little bit for you here. See this pyramid right here? Its neighbor, renal column between. Down here, pyramid pyramid, column between, cortex, medulla. So two very nice renal pyramids right here. There's a renal column. Here's another renal column in an actual kidney dissection. But not that much I get to ask you from this one. Now it's time for a little kidney histology. There's not that much as you look at your lab manual and Kidney histology is actually kind of fun, if you ask me. More fun definitely than digestive histology was. I think way more fun than endocrine and reproductive histology. And as simple, really, as respiratory histology. Follow along with me 
in your lab manual. So we're looking at a kidney right here. I can see the outer edge of the organ, which is, of course, the renal capsule. I can also see many, many round circular structures here. A round mass of cells with a little white space around them. These are renal corpuscles, and when I see them, I know that I'm looking at the cortex of the organ. When I don't see them, down here, believe it or not, these are just collecting duct after collecting duct after collecting duct. I'm in the medulla. But it probably would be best for us to look at this at a little higher magnification. So let me jump up a little bit. And I focus for us. And let's work our way over to the edge of the organ. So what I see right here is the renal capsule. Right here is the cortex of the organ because I see these structures. Now, let me tell you what they actually are first. So this mass of cells you see right here, this is the glomerulus. Surrounding it, this empty space, is the glomerular capsule. Now to me, these things look like a pepperoni pizza sitting in a pizza pan. You tell me if you think I'm wrong. Let me zoom in a little more. And find one of these things for us. Don't worry, we will, because they're around. So here's one on pretty high magnification. See the pizza sitting in the pizza pan. Some of you may have seen this last semester as an example of where we can find some simple squamous epithelium right there. But for Bio224 lab, the pizza is the glomerulus. The pan is the glomerular capsule. Pizza sitting in a pizza pan. Oh, and my food analogies are not done yet, people. I can see here in this view some proximal convoluted tubules and a nice distal convoluted tubule right there. Proximal convoluted tubule, proximal convoluted tubule there. Notice these things are fairly round in appearance. You may have seen them a semester ago as examples of simple cuboidal epithelium, if you want to think back to 223. I know that they are proximal convoluted tubules because the inside of this circle looks all fuzzy. That's characteristic of proximal convoluted tubules. So some people say they look sort of like a donut. I say no. I think they look a little bit more like a bagel. Why do I say a bagel? Because the middle is getting filled in. Proximal convoluted tubule here, proximal convoluted tubule there and there. If you see this structure over here that's much cleaner on the inside, this is a distal convoluted tubule. They tend to be a little more oblong in their appearance. I say it looks sort of like an eclair or a croissant, if you like. 
let's look around a little bit and see what else we can spot. So here is a perfectly good glomerulus, glomerular capsule, proximal convoluted tubule right there, beautiful. Distal convoluted tubule right here, notice it's cleaner inside. Just panning around a little. Okay, here's another beautiful glomerulus, glomerular capsule. Distal convoluted tubule right here. Not a really great proximal convoluted tubule. This happens to be one, but I'd look for one that's a little more round in appearance. Bagel-like, if you will. Glomerulus, glomerular capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, distal convoluted tubule, distal convoluted tubule. What's Captain America's line? Oh, I could do this all day. Okay, here we go. What else do you need besides this little food shop right here? Pizza, glomerulus. Pizza pan, glomerular capsule. Bagel, bagel, bagel. Proximal convoluted tubule. Eclair, distal convoluted tubule. Right there, perfect. If I see the pizzas, if I'm in the pizza parlor, that's the cortex because that's the only place these things are found. So what part of the organ is this? The pizza parlor is the cortex. This is the capsule. No pizzas, only collecting ducts, medulla. Simple as that. Okay, just another random kidney slide. Notice I'm in the pizza parlor, that makes this the cortex. Glomerulus, glomerular capsule. Glomerulus, glomerular capsule. Look for bagels. Proximal convoluted tubule, proximal convoluted tubule, proximal convoluted tubule. Look for some eclairs. Distal convoluted tubule, distal convoluted tubule, distal, distal, like that. The kidney. Okay, let's talk about the physiology portion of lab number seven. Now, it feels a little crowded in here, a little close for my taste, until we're all fully vaccinated, because there's five of us in here. Myself and four a &P students that I called in as volunteers for lab number seven. We needed three test subjects and one, what I affectionately like to call lab boss, to tell them what to do. So a total of four people. Now, that fourth one, the isotonic person, I'm not even sure if he goes to this college, but desperate times and all that. So what we have are three students who will drink various solutions. The hypotonic solution who drinks 750 mils of distilled water. The hypertonic student who drinks 150 mils of distilled water to which is added five grams of salt.
and an isotonic student who drinks 750 mils of distilled water to which we add 7 grams of salt. And then, of course, don't forget, I need what I like to call the lab boss or somebody to tell these three people when it's time to avoid their bladders, what data they are to collect. What you can see right here to my left is what's going to happen. First, the test subject will drink their solution as fast as they possibly can. Then, the lab boss will immediately send them to the restroom to avoid their bladder. They'll come back and get a specific gravity on that urine sample just as a way to practice. We're really not looking at this as a data point. We just want to show people how to use a refractometer. Then, 20 minutes later, and every 20 minutes after that, we will go void, 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 void for data collections. Each time the student comes back with a urine sample, yes, a real urine sample, they will get a specific gravity from that and the volume so that we can calculate urine output. One of the four voidings, typically I like to use the second or third data collection point, we will have the test subject use a chemical test strip to measure glucose and protein content in the urine. Sort of an easy passive thing, a lot of you will do this in your future lives. So you can see this done once. It's actually pretty fun. The students that are here will actually get a chance to do it. Those of you at home, you'll have to wait probably until you have some sort of clinical experience where you can do it knock on whiteboard, hopefully. After we've collected all the data in this handy data table you see at the end of your lab, then on the other side of this physiology experiment, you and I will talk about what this means with regard to a couple of hormones. ADH, antidiuretic hormone, and aldosterone, namely. So, let's take a look at this physiology. Let's get these lab students, the boss, and the three test subjects to work collecting some data for us.
wasn't it fun to watch those, and I'm doing air quotes here, students run around and collect their urinary data? Couldn't really think of a better way to do it in our online setting with the campus restrictions we have currently, so I just did the best that I could. Here in the physiology section, we need to talk about what we were attempting to do. So we were attempting to change, alter, modify kidney function by forcing three different people to drink specific solutions. So we had a, what, hypotonic person. What did they drink? 750 mils of distilled water only. We had a hypertonic person who drank 150 mils of distilled water with five grams of salt dissolved in it. This is a very small volume of a very concentrated salt solution. Trust me, I've done it a number of times. That one is somewhat unpleasant to drink. And then we had an isotonic person who drank 750 mils of distilled water containing about seven grams of salt. Now, what I need to let you in on here, a little secret, this person didn't really count for much of anything except to give us a frame of reference. We're really, you know, sort of a, a control or a standard to compare to. It's these two people that we're really looking at to see what those massively efficient kidneys will do in response to having a very large volume of dilute solution ingested or a very small volume of concentrated solution ingested. And we're trying to study what this will do to two hormones, ADH and aldosterone. So let's take maybe a little look at these two hormones, and I don't want to turn this into a big lecture, but depending on whether you have or have not discussed these fluid regulatory mechanisms yet, you might need a tiny bit of background. So ADH is a hormone that we make in the hypothalamus, releasing it from the posterior pituitary gland, and ADH and its partner over here, aldosterone, they both target the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct cells of a nephron. So each one of these hormones has the same target cells, but they give different commands when they get there. So these hormones, ADH from your hypothalamus, aldosterone from your adrenal gland, they cause different things to happen in these distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct cells regarding our formation of urine. Now, ADH, when it hits those cells, increases the reabsorption of water, H2O. So what I always tell people to think of for ADH is this is the hormone that says, save the water, meaning pull it out of the urine, save it into the blood. Urinate less. That's what this means. Not urinate more, urinate less. Aldosterone tells those same exact cells when it hits them to increase the reabsorption of sodium. It also affects a little potassium. You can talk about that in your lecture, but increase the reabsorption of sodium. This is the hormone that says save the sodium. 
meaning from the urine into the blood. Now I want you to look at what I just wrote here. So if antidiuretic hormone, ADH, is released, why would it be released? At what time would you want to save water in your body, not urinate it out? This would be times when you are dehydrated, right? If you haven't been drinking much water today, you're going to save whatever water you have. Your urine volume will go down. Your urine tends to be more concentrated. That's ADH. So if your blood volume is low, you want to save the water. If your blood is very concentrated, you want to save the water. Look at aldosterone. When would you want to save sodium? meaning keep it in your blood. This would be when your blood sodium levels are low, right? If your blood is to dilute, there's not enough sodium in it, then you'll want to save the sodium from your urine to the blood. Now, I don't want to steal all the thunder of your lecture instructors with these exciting hormones, but we will talk about these with relation to the data that we collect from our test subjects. Now, what I did was fill out a little data table here with some very typical numbers from our three people. The hypotonic person, the hypertonic person, and the isotonic person. Now remember, isotonic didn't really count for that much because they're placeholder. Actually, what this person drank was the 750 mils of water with 7 grams of salt. Maybe you recall that. That's essentially what we know in the biz. I'll try to write this with a uh, mouse. A cheap version of what's called a ringer's solution. No, that's not a vocabulary word for lab. Ringer's solution. So a isotonic solution doesn't do much to change this person's blood concentration, but it would up their blood volume because this was 750 mils of water they drank, wasn't it? 750 mils with the 7 grams of salt. That was this person. The hypertonic person, what did they drink? They drank 150 mils of water with five grams of salt. Very, very concentrated. Hypertonic. That's what we made their blood become. The hypotonic person drank 750 mils of just distilled water. So 750 mils of water only. That's what this person had. Now, when we look at what occurred, I want you to pay attention here. We measured their specific gravity for each person. Over five trips to the bathroom, measured their urine output in milliliters per minute. And I want you to see what happened. So let's first look at specific gravity. And I'm going to jump back up in your lab manual to right here. So specific gravity is measured using a refractometer and it's an indirect measurement really of a person's urine concentration. So you put a couple drops of urine on that flat piece of glass you saw in the video, a prism, look through it and we compare the refraction, the bending of light in that urine with the bending of light through a prism and compare that, believe it or not, to how it would bend if it was pure distilled water, which has a specific gravity of 1, distilled water does. So most of these values will be very close to 1, 
this is 1.010, 1.020, 1.030, like that. Right here, it reads about 1.041, 42. Give your best estimate there. I would probably say 41. And that means it's got some dissolved stuff in it. If we were closer down here, say, 1.004 that doesn't have much dissolved stuff in it. Now, for the chemistry lovers, specific gravity or urine gravity does not have a unit on it because we're comparing a density to a density, density of water and the density of urine, and guess what? All the units cancel out. So there are no units left. This is one of those weird values that does not have a unit on it. So, let's take a few notes here. This is probably what you should write down somewhere on a piece of scratch paper or write with this lab manual so you can have a full understanding of what's going on. So, as we look at this very carefully constructed data table, we can see our hypotonic student here which, remember, was the person who drank 750 mils of distilled water, just water. What would this do to this person's blood volume? Well, their blood volume would go way up, wouldn't it? I've just greatly increased their blood volume by almost a whole liter if they were to have absorbed all of that water, which they never would. But what would that do to their blood concentration if what's going into their blood is just water? Sure, their blood concentration would go down or decrease, wouldn't it? So they've got a whole bunch of blood volume and their blood is very dilute compared to normal, low concentration. So what would you expect the urine output to do? Just think about it for a minute. What would you expect the urine output to do for this person? And we don't even have to make a prediction because we can look and see what actually occurred, can't we? Because we have some data. So look at our hypotonic person on the far left here. What's happening? to the urine output in mils per minute with each void of the bladder. So the first voiding was 5, then 10, 14, 16. This is fairly typical. We see an increase of very high urine output in mils per minute. 16 would be extremely high, but that's a very high urine output we'd have in this person because we've dumped a whole bunch of water right into them. And what happens to the specific gravity? Remember, an indirect measure by comparing it to the specific gravity of water of their urine concentration. What's happening? 1.015, 1 1.011, 7.22. So it starts at a fairly normal level. Remember, you've probably seen in your lab manual anywhere from 1.003 to 1.030 kind of normal, but here it starts out at a fairly normal level and then it's falling, dropping like a stone. So their urine output volume is going way up while their urine concentration is going where? Way down. So if we look at our person again, our hypotonic student, their urine output is increasing, isn't it? Going up as expected, their specific gravity going down. So this person is producing a high volume of dilute urine, aren't they? And let's talk about the hormones. The two, remember we had two, ADH and aldosterone. 
Which one said save the water? ADH. High urine volume. Is this person saving the water? No. So this person has low ADH production. They are not attempting to save any water. In fact, they want to dump the water. What about aldosterone? Are they saving the sodium to their blood or letting the sodium go in their urine? They're saving it to their blood, aren't they? So this person, because the urine specific gravity is low, dilute urine. Remember, that's what this means. Dilute urine. This person is producing a lot of aldosterone, reducing their production of ADH. Now let's talk about that hypertonic person. This was, I'll change colors for us here. This was the person who drank 150 mils of water with five grams of salt. Now remember, that's very concentrated. What's this going to do to the person's blood volume? Well, adding 150 mils isn't going to do that much to it, but it is certainly going to do something to their blood concentration this person's blood concentration is going to be increasing as this fluid is absorbed. They're going to have concentrated blood, lots of sodium in it. So what do you expect to happen to their urine output here, their specific gravity here, and their hormone levels? Well, of course, if you are a with it student, you'll say, well, those will be exactly the opposite of the hypotonic person. Sure they will, but let's look at the data because it's all in the data. So let's look at this hypertonic person we have right here. So the hypertonic person right in the middle started out specific gravity, the same in the normal range. And then what happens to the concentration aka specific gravity of this person's urine. 1.015, 22, 32, 35, 40. It's going way up, isn't it? And look at this urine output. It is so low, terribly low. So if we look at our table that we're making, so this person's urine output would be dropping like a stone. Why? Because they're trying to save water to their blood to counteract this concentration of their blood. So this person's urine output would be decreasing and their specific gravity is increasing, of course. Or we would say that their urine is very concentrated. Concentrated urine. And the hormones, yes, of course, we know they would be exactly the opposite, but let's talk about it for a minute. So the ADH, they're saving the water. This person wants to save the water. And their aldosterone, do they want to save salt? No, they want to get rid of the salt. So you have to remember that these two hormones, ADH and aldosterone, ADH addresses water. Aldosterone addresses, for our purposes, sodium. And we can manipulate the kidneys into responding to these changes of blood volume and blood concentration by what we force these volunteers, haha, -ha, student volunteers in lab, to drink. Remember, the isotonic person, we're not even considering them because they drank what essentially amounts to be a ringers, an isotonic solution. So we'd expect their urine volume to go up some just because of the volume, but we wouldn't expect much change in the concentration. Notice that we have the pH and the sugar protein tests. We just do those with a chemical dipstick so you can see that they're done. We expect negative results for those, and that's actually what we got in the urine samples we had in lab that you saw with our three student volunteers. So 
play this, rewind this, look at it, make sure you know what happens to these hormone levels, which student produced the highest volume of urine, lowest volume of urine, highest concentration, lowest concentration, and who did what with each hormone. This is all fair game for your next lab quiz. Try to make it fairly straightforward here and try to not steal too much thunder from your lecture instructors because this is very interesting stuff to talk about. So consider some of these things when you hear about these fluid regulatory hormones in your lectures, which for many of you will be, you know, chapters 26 and 27 of the textbook. For now, just remember this table is what's fair game for your lab quiz. Urine output, specific gravity, and the hormones for our hypotonic and hypertonic student volunteers in lab. With that said, I will sign off for lab number seven and see you people in lab number eight, which for us does not even have any physiology in it.